Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, uh, today, as uh, uh, Mizan Mulk said, uh, uh, it will be about uh, uh, reforming uh, modernity, um, a work that uh, deals uh, exclusively with, uh, uh, well, exclusively is, is not a precise word, with Taha Abdul Rahman Taha's work, but also puts him in the context of, uh, of, of uh, the work of other reformers, in particular, the, in the context of the work uh, of uh, Muhammad Abid Jabiri, uh, against whose background really Taha was working. Uh, so one can say that the Arab writers on reason, and here mostly I'm referring to Jabiri, as well as of course many others, but, but he is, as I said, he is the, the voice that uh, almost defined the uh, Taha's reaction. Uh, one can say that the Arab writers on reason and rationality reflect the modern bias in normalizing and rendering normative a narrow conception of rationality, one that we now know to be instrumentalist to the core. The general attack on Sufism and Gnosis launched by Jabari and others has amounted to an attack on what I call concept of the concept of inner liberty which was one of the hallmarks of Islamic culture. And for those who were not here uh, uh, before, uh, I, I discussed this at length yesterday uh, over several occasions. It is precisely at this juncture, the point where two powerful concepts of liberty come into a clashing encounter, that Abdul Rahman Taha's philosophy shows its dramatically qualitative difference from that of his fellow countrymen. Uh, specifically Muhammad Abid al-Jabri. If we accept that in the matter of the formation of subjectivity, these two conceptions of liberty stand at the center of the debate over modern life and the modern subject, then we might say that it is precisely here that the most fundamental and crucial difference between Taha and the rest of modern Arab intellectual lives. In fact, I will argue in this lecture and the next that it is this encounter between the two concepts of freedom that defines, and very likely will define, the battles and wars over the question of how to exit our present predicament, meaning modernity. Uh, Stefan Sheehy uh, perceptively observed that modern Arab thought, I quote, articulates a subject who's, who perpetually recognizes a master of knowledge that precludes itself. This self also almost invariably constructs uh, the self as other, where the European self mediates the relationship between knowledge and Arab selfhood. It is only this supplemental mediation of the European self that can bestow knowledge and thereby mastery and substantive presence to the Arab, uh, to the modern Arab, uh, end of quote. <coughs> Why this is undoubtedly true, it is only one side of the coin. The other side stands in great tension with this vision. For as we see in Jabari's work, there are two selves at work. A European secular self and an Islamic ethical self whose genealogy and thought structure originate a non-anthropocentric and non-secular deeper self. A self that consciously rejects negative forms of liberty and embraces robust, stateless, stateless, positive, and inner forms. Jabari's work, the culmination of a current that began with Boutros al-Bustani and Georgi Zaidan, and continued with Ahmad Amin, Hassan Hanafi, and several others, ought to be seen not merely as the production of an individual thinker, but rather as an intellectual blueprint or a thought, a structure of thought, that brings to the fore a right form of this dualism. This is precisely, it is precisely this binary dualism that gives Taha's project its conditions of possibility. He appears at, at, at a point in late modernity where the fissures and cracks in the modern project have allowed a return of the et ethical. If Europe's hegemonic liberalism and secularism can be can, can, came to blot and obliterate Islamic values between 1850 and uh, 1950, 
which is a crucial century. And if political Islamism appears as a misconceived reaction to the problems of colonialism and hegemony, then Taha's philosophical project is the synthesis that comes after but rejects both the thesis and the antithesis. Ultimately, his is a temporarily, temporary, <coughs> temporarily modern project, actually an exquisitely modern project, that attempts to resuscitate and harness Islamic ethical time for what we can easily describe as a truly postmodern critique, an ethical philosophy par excellence. I have discussed the details of Taha's project in Reforming Modernity, and to some extent have treated his work as a great ally for my own thinking. I now want to engage in a more direct critique of aspects of his work, as I think that those aspects can straitjacket any project that truly aims at escaping the traps of hegemonic European thought. This has to do with Taha's conception of modernity itself, which I think is the single most problematic aspect of his, his thought. It has to do with his definition of modernity, which I summarily define as heavily Kantian, as emerging from slavish and constricted minds uh, to, to, to free ethical, rational, and willing subjects. Thinking about his definition of the concept and the world that, in, that is modernity, and about the ways he dealt uh, with, its, with it philosophically, I might venture to say that the problem facing Taha has to do with, with, with history and hist histori histori historization, something reminiscent of the problems I discussed yesterday that faced uh, Saeed himself in, uh, in the problem of Orientalism. Uh, but let me first place Taha's critique in the wider context of his project. I do so in a series of summary propositions, just to summarize this project for you, so we'll contextualize the rest later. Uh, first, co contemporary Arab Islamic thought has mishandled the Torah, the, the intellectual cultural history of, of, of Islam, in good part due to its inability to carve for itself an autonomous epistemological value, to be independent intellectually. Second, a new methodology of rethinking the present and the past of, of this thought is a priority. Third, this methodological deadlock is due to unquestioning dependence on a misconceived Western application of modernity's spirit. The assumption being that there is a difference between the spirit of modernity and its varied applications. So Taha's one of the, his major uh, proposition is that, is that modernity is not just one ball of things, but rather that it has a spirit and it has applications. And what went wrong is not the spirit of it, but rather the application uh, at the hands of, 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 of Europe. Fourth, this spirit is otherwise universally valid and therefore trans-historical. Trans-historical, this is a key word. Fifth, the spirit has the potential of producing multiple modernities, the Islamic being only one. Sixth, prospective Islamic modernity differs from its actual Western counterpart in its insistence on ethics as its defining feature. Seven, this ethics is inseparable from religion, even politics. Eighth, Islam, as a revealed religion, can establish this version of modernity. Ninth, Islamic modernity proposes A, corrections to Western modernity, and B, a healthier modus vivendi and modus operandi in this world. And definitely that means that it is healthier way of living in this world, not above the world. This is my own, of course, um, representation of his thought. So he doesn't say it in this, I'm not translating it. This, this is, I have been writing for a while, speaking about living in the world and above the world. 
the living above the world is what we are doing today. Living in the world is what we should be doing. Right? Tenth, to accomplish this modernity, an essentially different concept of the human must be fostered and ultimately developed. So the rest of my uh, talk today is going to be talking about a bit of critique, and then later I will attend to the concept of the new human, which is the subject of really of what I wanted to accomplish in that book. After all, this was the 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 the, the kind of the, uh, the jewel of the crown. We see that from the third to the fifth considerations, there is the distinction between the spirit and the application of modernity, as I have just said. The spirit rests on three foundations or principles, all of which are regarded as indispensable to any modern project. The first of these is the principle of majority, which one can easily argue is an iteration of Kant's idea in ideas in what is enlightenment, his famous article. In fact, in expanding this principle, Taha relies on this philosopher and his tract explicitly. He cites it. One of modernity's key principles is that it realizes the movement of the individual or group from a state of mental minority to a state of intellectual majority. With the former, the minority described as a condition in which rational autonomy is lacking and where an external or higher authority is needed for guidance. You see the references to the church and Christianity, etc., etc. Notice here, notice how European history is being conflated with Islamic history by Taha here. There is a complete dehistorization of Kant, taking him to say something important but equally applicable to Europe's and Islam's history, or histories rather, as if the two were one and the same. But this is not all. The spirit of modernity is emphatically said to be an ideal, mithal, represented in a set of principles and ideas that possess nearly countless applications. Western modernity is thus nothing more than one, though admittedly the most famous. What appears to be problematic here is his claim that the roots of modernity spirit are not the work or product of Western society alone. Shunning the claim that it is a creation of the West, modernity is thus said to be the product of human society in its various stages of development, going back to early epochs of history, Western or not. As I stated earlier, this vision of modernity allows Taha to, to, to claim that modernity's spirit, because it is a common human legacy, can be realized in any society and in fact was realized in earlier societies in ways different from those achieved in the West. Although he never really specifies which societies were modern in all times. Thus both te tempor temporally and spatially, modernity is not exclusively Western or cultural specific in any sense. Modernity could have conceivably existed in the Middle Ages and can e equally be the property of the Chinese, the Africans, or any other uh, uh, group at any time. In addition, and as a matter of strict historical analysis, the principle of majority in the manner in which Taha, in the manner in which Taha invokes it is admittedly Kantian. As mentioned, Taha explicitly invokes Kant when he introduces this concept thereby giving it, as Kant does, a universal validity meant to apply to all historical zones, cultures, and civilizations, down to the present. And it is here where the, the distinction between spirit and reality of, or, uh, of mod, uh, or application of modernity seems highly problematic to me. Kant's manifesto, What is Enlightenment, is a simplified statement of his general philosophy of the autonomous rational will. A, philosoph a philosophical triad, that is freedom, rationality, and will, or willing, a philosophical triad that is central to his overall thinking. Any observer critical of a Eurocentric outlook can readily see that Kant was, in everything he argued, very much European, 
And in this, I do not see a problem. Kant was talking about Europe, and given his anti-colonial stance, he does not seem to have engaged in a universalizing discourse. In what is Enlightenment, as in almost all his writings on reason, will, and especially autonomy, he was reacting to several centuries worth of church and monarchical abuses of, Europe, of the European population. His was a particularly intense, context-specific European experience of tyranny that cannot be readily extended to other cultures. Seen as a vehicle of this tyranny, then religion and the religious thus come to epitomize for Kant the very stuff of, of immaturity <coughs> against which he systematically militated. It is possible, however, that Taha identifies with the Kantian concept of the spirit because he thinks that today's Muslims suffer from the same bondage vis-a-vis -vis European hegemony as Europeans themselves had suffered at the hands of the church and the monarch. But even if we accept this shared denominator as a valid argument, the concept of the spirit can hardly be universal, universalized. Muslim, Muslims' relationship to their past is dramatically different from the European relationship to its past, or Europe's relationship to its past. And even more critically, Taha's doctrine of wasl ittisal, that's a whole doctrine that he elaborated, uh, uh, that, 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 uh, that uh, continuity with tradition is assumed and must be insisted on until the, uh, there is a good reason not to. Ittisal, with the doctrine of Ittisal, he runs against the foundational assumptions of the Kantian rupture with what is otherwise a history defined by tyranny and bondage. So here there is kind of almost we are bordering on a contradiction. Nor is this all. It is odd that the universal principles of modernity spirit identified by Taha do not include the component of morality and ethics which he elsewhere and almost everywhere regards as the cornerstone of an ideal conception of, of modernity. This is puzzling, even if we assume that the ethical component or contribution is one that belongs exclusively to the Islamic forms of modern, modernity's realization. If it is indeed the case that morality and ethics are not principles of modernity spirit writ large, then one would be compelled to argue that they, they are, when all is said and done, only contingent and accidental features of a possible Islamic modernity, and not essential to, to, the, to his project. When expounding the principles of the spirit of modernity, Taha is quick to note how certain aspects of these principles were misused or misapplied, resulting in situations contrary to this spirit, or what might be termed its original intent. As an instance of such perversions of modernity spirit, he cites the rationalization of the technocratic field, which was intended to be a tool and a means for the improvement of the human condition and the liberation of man from his own whimsical and arbitrary conduct, only to become, for modern man and woman, the tyrannical master rather than the, the, the servant, which he is referring to the tyranny what I call the tyranny of bureaucracy today. The faults of the application of modernity are so many that it would seem that the modern West has been governed by a universal law that Taha called the law of converting aims to their opposites. Here he lists a series of statements by French writers highly critical of the modern project, all to the effect that modernity is a project that does not know how to control itself, leading to regression and backwardness as much as to progress. He cites multiple examples as evidence, chief among them that modern man aimed to dominate nature, but nature created effects he did not desire, such as modern diseases. And that was before the COVID. There is also the threat of nuclear destruction the spread of weapons of mass destruction, explosive population growth, environmental pollution, the ozone hole, and much else that is equally devastating. My list is different, as you noticed from yesterday. It is longer and much more even uh, pernicious. Um, 
And whenever any of these sectors is reformed, the consequences of the reformed field not only continue to produce negative effects, the reformers are increasingly unable to predict and control the effects of their own work, which is so true. Western modernity has also constructed a transnational capitalist system that it cannot control, and whose fate and consequence or consequences it cannot predict. It has also tried to irrevocably sever all its uh, connections with traditional sources of authority, only to discover that these latter have returned in different forms that are more complex and convoluted than their uh, pre precursors. What was originally intended to lead to domination over things in the world has turned into its opposite, subordination and servitude. And what was originally in, in te, uh, 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 meant to lead to freedom and autonomy has instead led to dependency and subjection. This reversal in the Western application is one that involves a myopic vision of what makes for a means and what constitutes an end. It is, character, it is characteristic of this application that in its first phases and ends in the original conception would be achieved by particular means. But, at, but as, this, as time passes, the means become an end in and of themselves. The concept of change is a prime example. Change was required to accomplish certain ends. But what transpired thereafter is that the means uh, itself became an end, with the result that change is now sought after for its own sake. Which is, by the way, the same thing with, with, with money and with the power and everything. Is, uh, the corporation is making money for the sake of money. There is no other rationalization. The same can be said of progress. That is, progress now exists for the sake of progress. Just as we are taught to believe in development for the sake of development and in the logic of the corporation, money for money, etc., etc. In this context, then, how do, how do we distinguish between spirit and application? More importantly, how does one know that the spirit, or at least certain aspects of the spirit, is not inherently given to excess that will convert what is intended into a diametrical, its diametrical opposite? This critique goes to a number of major modern phenomena and institutions that have made modernity what it is, namely capitalist in its classic liberal and neoliberal forms with a modern state that is presumably a sort of social contract application, the pervasive practice of the principles of autonomy and much else. All this calls into question the validity of the spirit of modernity as a historically viable concept. As a strict matter of history, few thinkers and scholars would be willing to risk the claim that modernity could either have developed the system of, of capitalism as a contingent merely contingent feature of the modern project, that is, without capitalism having any structural relation to its spirit or principles, or to put it differently, that the system of capitalism is nothing more than a misapplication of the spirit and its principles, or an altogether unintended consequence, having nothing to do with these principles in the first place. We must therefore question the historicity of the distinction between spirit and its historical and cultural location on the one hand, and between principles and their applications on the other. And once we do so, we must, be, must also be prepared to question whether Taha's concept of modernity spirit is sustainable within the content and form of his overall project. I'm going to stop here for now. Uh, we can speak about details uh, later, but, but the idea is that the the, 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 it is uh, difficult for me to, for example, to believe that uh, for the rise of capitalism in modernity is an unintended uh, result of, of, of modernity. It is not a part of the spirit, but it, is, it just, just rose up from somewhere. When in fact, the entirety of the history of the Enlightenment and Europe since the 16th, 17th century, at the latest, speaks of, of a massive wave uh, within the intellectual and economic forces that, that not only created capitalism, but justified it. 
It, capitalism is not just a, 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 an economic movement. It's an intellectual movement mm -hmm. as well. And so I don't know how, where, where the spirit and the application here can be separated from each other. <coughs> uh, next, for the next, uh, this is the, the critical part. The next part is going to be about, about how do we construct, mm. if I may dare say so, how do we construct the new human? What are the characteristics that should go into the, that subjectivity? That's why we're here. Thank you very much. All right. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. So this is the third book in this wonderful trilogy, uh, one that I read a little while ago when it came out and, and greatly enjoyed. Um, but in the trilogy, I, I in fact found the book to be least satisfying. And I'll explain very briefly today. And in fact, Professor Halak today has already started talking about stuff that uh, that sort of looks at, begins to broach what, what I find unsatisfying in the framing of the book. Um, first, uh, the discovery of Abdurrahman Taha, may Allah prolong his life and, 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 and bless his scholarship, um, was a pleasant surprise for me. This was 2014-15 when some of the students of uh, Professor uh, Abdurrahman Taha uh, were uh, my colleagues and students in, uh, in Qatar. And uh, there we read some of the books of uh, uh, al Baha together. And what I found about him over time is both intriguing um, and, you know, I think that he occupies an important, distinctive place in the um, canon, if you will, of interesting Muslim scholars today. I certainly wouldn't put him as the most interesting Muslim scholar, and explain why. His background, his, his PhD from um, Sorbonne French in philosophy of language, and he has uh, for several decades now worked as an interlocutor with uh, uh, the, more, the, the more established uh, Moroccan philosopher Jabri, his senior in the, the same university. So it's very much a Moroccan uh, dialogue that's been going on for decades. And, and for that reason, I think it's really valuable. Whenever a dialogue, a discourse between serious thinkers goes on for some time in which people don't use guns and prisons to end dialogue, you get something good. And unfortunately, there isn't too much of that going on in, in the Muslim world. Uh, and so this is this was valuable. At the same time, um, Abdurrahman Taha's um, actual political situation in Morocco is something that I think, because he's very much a living thinker, um, it needs to be understood. He is part of the Shia Tariqa, Sufi Tariqa, which. Uh, is, which has a complex history. The tariqa split a little in a gener generation earlier between um, him and his tariqa, the branch that Abdul Rahman Taha belongs to, and the other one is Abdul Salam Yassin. And the difference between them is that Abdul Salam Yassin took a, an independent critical position to government's policies where the Shishia tariqa serves as justification for whatever the king is doing. And this is not unknown, this is something recognized by numerous scholars who have written on this. Um, and so, Bushishia Tariqa's practices, which uh, uh, Dr. Abdurrahman Baha participates in, include a total, depend, total sort of hierarchical relationship to and complete obedience uh, to the sheikhs and ultimately to the king. King can do no wrong. Abu Salam Yassin was imprisoned, and this is also a Sufi tariqa, Abu Salam Yassin Sufi tariqa, but one that is not in favor and has been critical of the Shishia branch, its sister branch. But this shows that, of course, you could be a Sufi, but you could be a Sufi of a different kind. And Abdurrahman Taha chooses to be a Sufi of the kind that is completely subservient to a corrupt kingdom. How does that explain his 
ethics? To me, that's a question mark. Second, um, when he talks about Kantian reason that Professor Palaka rightly criticized, but even before I critique it, if you simply take it on its face value, Kant's three um, elements of autonomous reason, which is maturity, majority, uh, originality, and critique. But if you look at his disciples and followers, and if you look at the tarifa that he belongs to, they do not practice any of those aspects of reason. So where is, who is he preaching to? Certainly not to his tarifa and not to his followers. Um, in fact, if you look at the accounts of the tarifa, you know, obedience to the, the sheikh of the tarifa and, and the idea that the, tarifa, the sheikh of the tarifa is always right, is often repeated in those circles. Again, so if, if he is really in, in, in advocating Kantian critique, then certainly one doesn't see that in his practice. Um, the other um, aspect of uh, Abdul Rahman Taha that I find problematic is in fact uh, discussed much more eloquently by Professor Halak, which is his notion of modernity and of course the separation of the spirit of modernity from the applications of modernity shows to me a a much more troubled or rather limited relationship to history of Western modernity, right? So he is a very good reader. I, have to, I should say, I guess I should start with, with positive. He is absolutely amazingly well learned in languages and he reads Kant and, you know, uh, in German, I, I cannot afford that, or Foucault in French, which I can't afford to do. Uh, so, of course, in, in a sense, he is uh, very much a European philosopher who is very competently working in Arabic, very much competent in Arabic, and if nothing else, his emphasis on language as the uh, medium of philosophy, one that one cannot set aside, and, and his emphasis on Arabizing terms in ways that are not merely copies of European terms, but rather genuine Arabic, Islamic, traditional translations so he has a new translation for every term. So he doesn't accept Almaniya for secularism, he would call it Dahraniya, mm. because he can connect it to something in the tradition in a deeper. I think that that's a great service. So in terms of language, yeah. I think that that's his single most important contribution. When it comes to <coughs> ethics and politics, <coughs> I am slightly less impressed. Um, his reading of Torah, he talks about Torah, so when I, I look at his reading of Al-Ghazali and Ibn Taymiyyah, two scholars that I personally study, and I think that is his reading of Torah is, on the one hand, the good part is that it's generous. He doesn't go into age-old disputes. He reads everyone and reads broadly. But on the other hand, it, is, it appears to me to be a somewhat limited uh, reading, which doesn't... Uh, in other words, it's not the same as scholars who are dedicated to Ghazali, either in the Muslim world or in the West. So it is somewhat general. And this means that his, the thing that he's defending, the Torah, he spends less time studying that and more time dealing with Western critiques in some respects. And I think that this doesn't mean necessarily a major flaw, but rather it is the beginning of a project in which uh, he's simply laying foundations. And finally, uh, and this I do find to be a, 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 something that, uh, a mentionable flaw, which is his limited engagement with living Muslims, with, uh, other than Jabari, other than his very particular Moroccan context. But there is a lot going on in South Asia, in Egypt, elsewhere in the Muslim world, and when he simply tends to dismiss them all by saying, by 
creating categories and putting Islamists in this category, and there is no such thing as Islamists. Anybody who studied Islamism 20th century, you know that this is a category of Orientalists. If there is a category of Orientalists created, it's Islamism. And that category, whether you like it or not, whether it's useful or not, it covers up such great diversity from ISIS to hair in, 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 in the US, everything is Islamism if you like it to be. Right? If you don't like it, you can label it. And his labeling and categorization tends to, so somebody like Muhammad Iqbal to Daraz, uh, Muhammad Bila Daraz, or you know, these range of thinkers, none of them find any serious engagement um, in my in interaction. Now, he's an extremely prolific writer, and uh, I don't know if he has engaged with them in some of his earlier writings that I haven't read, uh, but I, I read mostly secondary literature about him because he, he, he publishes a book every year. Um, so, but nevertheless, in so far as I have seen, there is somewhat independent strain, which perhaps is his uh, refusal to engage with many of these allows him to create new sets of problems. Uh, but I think for it to become a grounded project in the Muslim world, uh, there needs to be greater engagement with other living Muslim thinkers. That's all. Thank you so much. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, only getting better from yesterday to today. I'm really excited about what we're talking about. Just one quick clarification. When, when you talk about the principle of majority, we're, we're really talking about Kant's idea of intellectual maturation right, of the individual. So majority and maturity could be interchangeable then in that way. Okay, just want to be clear. And then the, the other question really has to do with, you know, I, I first discovered this with Anthony Giddens, his book, wonderful book, but tough to read, The Consequences of Modernity. And then I went backwards to, to Durkheim. And so I'm wondering uh, about that. And Giddens says that the distanciation of the self, or the alienation of the self, our, our alienation from uh, the product of our labor and, uh, and our fragmentation from society, just like Durkheim's idea of the anomie, that, um, that, that this is a hallmark of, of modernity. And so I'm just wondering if Taha addresses this question of the, the alienation of the self in his, in his writings. Uh, yeah, definitely. This is, this is, uh, he uh, comes through uh, with this through the concept of ruh, mm. the soul. And uh, his emphasis and one of uh, his uh, almost repetitive uh, statements throughout his works is that torturing the body is much easier than torturing the soul. And so the soul is always a locus of concern for him. And the, the alienation, fragmentation, um, marginalization of the soul has always been his concern throughout. So yes, uh, to him, this is this, the, the, the issue of consciousness. I mean, uh, he does not, uh, um, he always finds substitutes for the modern terms mm -hmm. in the Islamic tradition. So the, the ruh functions to displaces all sorts of uh, categories within, within Western philosophy, uh, the nafs. Uh, also, uh, he is in, uh, something I, I, I wanted to discuss uh, mm. today, but, but there is no time, is that one of the contributions he made, and I think he is almost unique in this, I don't want anybody else who did this, is that he created a philosophical dictionary uh, mm. uh, in, 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 throughout his work. He is never, uh, and, and for a good philosophical reason, it's not just wants to, to show how original and brilliant he is. That is not obviously, he is too modest to do this. What, 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 uh, but he feels the same need I feel all the time, and I know that others complain about it in, in one way or another, is that we cannot, as I said yesterday, we, we cannot use the, the language to represent another system of thought foreign to the to the to the to the to the uh, um, cerebral existence of the of the of the language itself, mm. the first language. The tra trans and I refer to this as a, the problem of translation. Mm. 
So in order for him to translate properly from the Islamic heritage, he needed to, uh, to, to, to create his own uh, concepts. Drawing on the Islamic tradition, but also not using the Islamic terms either. He was changing the Islamic terms themselves. Like Farabi did. Uh, a thousand years before. To, to some extent, yeah. but, but it is much more massive in, uh, in, in, in Taha than Farabi. So how, how, does, how does he give expression to Anomi in, uh, in I, I don't, I, I wouldn't be able to tell you this okay. specifically. I have to go back and look at the, but, but the, generally the, he does this in, in, in almost, but interestingly, when it comes to Rushd and, uh, and, and uh, Buluq, mm. uh, he uses this tra just simple translation of Kant. Mm. Wow. That's that is also significant. Mm -hmm. But if I may have uh, the, uh, I, I don't. Uh, the, my good colleague here raised uh, several important. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but but there is one one of them. One of the the issues that he raised deserves um, a, a counter comment because it is uh, quite important. Um, the uh, his 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 affiliation with the, that kind of Sufism, which is uh, politically docile and submissive, uh, that's what I understood you to say. Um, well, first, insofar as I'm concerned, I don't have to make every detail and fact of every thinker I'm interested in to be relevant for my project. I take what is relevant, what is, what is important to me, what is relevant to me, and I can leave the rest. Because I'm adapting certain ideas from others, as we all do, in order to construct something. There's no ex nihilo construction. You need to find the building blocks from places. Everybody does this. When Kant did his work, also he went to basically Berkeley, Locke, Hume, made Hume. Hume was half of Kant's house is really either a reaction or the bricks that he borrowed from Hume. So what you, what people do this all the time, even the best and most brilliant philosophers. So for, for me, Taha is important because he provides me with certain arsenal that I can draw on. So if he were politically submissive, supposing that I agree with this proposition, it, it doesn't affect my take on him. And it doesn't affect what I wanted to do in the book, because the book is concerned with a particular uh, contour or framework. I don't have to have every detail about everything that Taha did in, in the book. Unless it is, I make of it a certain, certain way, uh, this is the sovereignty of the author. I'm sorry, every author in this case is sovereign. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, but there is much more to uh, this than this, 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 this uh, uh, situation. <coughs> I think Taha, in, in, in so many ways, having read his uh, Ruh al in particular, which is like 500 pages work, and, and very impressive, one of the, I think one of his best shots. Um, I find that actually he is, he is uh, uh, politically careful in order to be able to do his work on the strategic, basic, tactical level. He just doesn't want to be bothered by Okay, let's go to prison now. <laughs> he's, not, he's, not, he's not the kind of Ibn Taymiyyah who I don't think he would be able to write about 15, 20 books in prison like Ibn Taymiyyah did. <laughs> Ibn Taymiyyah spent probably one quarter of his adult life in prison and he produced a lot. Sometimes I entertain this idea. I thought maybe I should make some trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so, I can, so, so nobody will, will bother me. I can sit there <laughs> and write. You call me out, this is right. <laughs> exactly. So, so the, 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 for, uh, but that is no indication that he is not interested in it. His concept of politics, which explains why he is probably with this particular order, not another, is that his interest, his, his concept of politics is like mine. We share one thing. For me, politics is two levels at least. One is the one that you see every day, and people talk about how this party or this state and what happened between them. That's, that's politics I'm not interested in. I'm interested in politics as it dictates the way we live in the world and organize ourselves at the most structural basic level. In other words, I'm interested in the deeper structures of politics that give manifestation to a particular form of active, what I call superficial politics. Because what, what, I, what, what most people call politics today to me and to Taha, uh, and I think I could again, speak on his behalf, I'm kind of betting here some horses, that he will agree that it is superficial. 
it does not lead us to correct knowledge. To study political science is literally, as, as, as one could say, is to spin AIDS in the air. I have no great faith in political science in terms of, uh, unless political science goes deep into the <coughs> structures of a human life and asks the fundamental question, what kind of subjectivity of a human being that you can locate in the world and in relation to other individuals with the same sub subjectivity that can create a form of, or a, or, or a system of politics that is very different from what we have today. And, and uh, this is the subject, by the way, of, of the next book, the one I'm working on, is I'm interested in the quality of the political man, the quality of the political man in Europe in the last 400 years, <clears throat> and the quality of the polit political man in Islam until the 19th century. And I want to just to compare them, not because of any, I'm not saying, they were, all I'm saying is that these are two models of politics, two ways of doing politics in the world that are qualitatively different. They cannot be more different from each other uh, anywhere. I don't know any greater difference. But we cannot keep thinking that politics has only one way of existence, one epistemology and one ontology, the one that we have been seeing in the last 200 years. There is another form of politics that can be dissected and analyzed and presented to the to our, our minds and, 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 and audiences that is so different. He is interested in this, but he doesn't bring it, I think, clearly enough in Ruh al-Din. And in many ways, I would want to tell him, re write another uh, a companion to Ruh al-Din. It needs another, at least, smaller volume. Uh, but this is what I'm interested in. So I don't think that he is neglecting the political, but he is a much more, much more deep thinker than busy himself with, with what the other Sufi orders are doing. The other Sufi orders, and this is my final remark, are trying to resist the king in order to change the players, but cannot change the rules of the game. And this is another thing, is that the politics no. everywhere is one game. People try to get, grab it, the Islamists actually try to want, to want, why do they want an Islamic state? Because basically they are not changing anything in the modern state. All they want is to be as Islamists in the state to say we are Islamists, but actually they are just different players than the others. The rules of the game is still the same. What Taha is talking about, I think, and what I more vocally am talking about, in, and in the next book this is going to become very obvious because I think it is a major, a major kind of project, is that I am interested in in another, uh, in another, in another game altogether, another set of set of rules of the game, and how that should be played as well. Thank you. That's yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, this might be um, maybe overly simplistic or uh, out of left field, but I was very interested in the distinction between the spirit of modernity and its application. And we've seen it in other places. So the obvious example is Iqbal, Muhammad Iqbal in his reconstruction of religious thought in Islam. He actually makes the same point. And he says the spirit of the Quran, he's been criticized for his own reasons, but the spirit of the Quran is decidedly anti-classical. It's modern. And he, um, he makes that argument on the basis of inductive reasoning, as opposed to pure deductive reasoning, whose application is primarily in the realm of natural science. So what would you think of this kind of uh, attempt to distinguish between the spirit of something and its application? The other place I've seen this is back <coughs> with my old friend Abu Rehan al-Biruni in his uh, exchange with Ibn Sina, where they're looking at the, the, the universe in two very, very different ways. And I remember Alessandro Bausani, who wrote on this exchange back in the 1970s, he says, you know, uh, uh, perhaps in a footnote, one of the reasons why we didn't have a scientific revolution in the Islamic world is because they, were already, they didn't have the tensions with a modern spirit of inquiry that we saw emerge in the West, which kind of dovetails for me with the observation of Iqbal. So I would love to hear your, your comments. I'm not, I'm, 
I think that we're talking about two different things. Yes, yes. I, I think what you are talking about is something much more palatable because it is, it is what you are, I think, what, what Iqbal was trying to do, uh, in so far as I remember it, but I read, I read Iqbal a long, long, long time ago when I was a very uh, young, young man. That's, that's an issue of memory here. But if I were to recall, is, it is about simply what is the intention of something? What, what it is, is the, is the, that does the Quran have intentions to or, or, or ways of hermeneutical uh, interpretations that can uh, be accommodated in the modern world or not? Uh, this is a different uh, issue. I think all modern Muslim modern reformists somehow dealt with this issue. So mm -hmm. for, for, uh, Fazlur Rahman was one of the most prominent ones in terms of how the Quran. But the, the, but but I think Taha is talking about something else. I think Taha is talking about that, that, that the enlightenment, basically. I, I think he's saying that the enlightenment, basically, is in the spirit of the enlightenment is good, but the, but, but the Europe did not apply it well. This is a crucial, crucial point. Because if we think that the spirit of the enlightenment is good, then we are still trying to figure out things that we should have forgotten about a long time ago. Because, for example, there is, and that's why I concluded my remarks about capitalism <coughs> in, the, in, this, in this lecture. Is, is it is impossible to separate between between capitalism and the industrial and bureaucratic revolutions in modernity from the concept of, uh, of, of, of freedom and liberty. One can say that liberalism actually is made of many people will tell you well liberalism is difficult to define. You know, it's different. I mean, everything can be defined except liberalism, and that, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. But we have to define liberalism because we see its intellectual work in operation, and we see its actual manifestations in reality in operation. And liberalism can, it has many sides, yes, of course, it has many dimensions, and we can speak about many, many things in it, but in, insofar as I'm concerned, liberalism has stands on two feet, or on two legs. One is exactly the liberal, the, liberal the, the, the capitalist system that is justified by an entire philosophy in the Enlightenment. The idea of liberty, negative liberty, is not just a political uh, uh, concept. And even if it were a political concept, as I argued yesterday, it is also an economic concept. One thing we do not understand today well is that there is no separation in the modern project between the political and the economic. So when we speak about economic developments, we are actually speaking of, about political developments because they work together. So when I tell you, for example, that when, 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 when the United Kingdom, when, when Britain wanted to colonize uh, India, what did it do? First thing, what did it do? It did not send an army. It sent what? The East India Company. This is not a, it is not a chance. Behind the corridors of the British Parliament and the British of government offices and the, the, the room of uh, the ch Chamber of Commerce and all of these institutions, Lots of discussion and talk happened and planning and thinking that actually made everything connect with each other. The politicians were talking about with the, with the, with the, with the, with the traders and the merchants. Everybody was and the merchants were the politicians and the politicians were the merchants. Uh, uh, the politicians went to India to make a fortune. This is, it was even declared, said outrightly. So why are we separating between politics and, and, and the, so political economy is one of the most fruitful, uh, uh, fruitful uh, fields of this discussion today. I must agree about this one. And so liberalism stands on the foot of uh, one, one leg is the economic system with its protective intellectual apparatus. That's one. And the other leg is the political system that protects the other leg. Because you really cannot run too far with one leg. You need the other one to make the other one run. And the other one is really the, what we call democracy, what we call liberalism, what we call the, uh, the, uh, uh, elections, what we call uh, uh, whatever that is, constitutes a liberal democracy. 
There is no capitalism that can live without liberal democracy, and no liberal democracy can live without capitalism. If we understand that these two are the two legs of the same body, of the same human, then we realize that, in fact, there is no distinction between the ideas that came in the, about freedom from Kant to <coughs> Bentham to uh, 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 James, uh, James Stuart Mill, John, uh, John Stuart and his father, James, as well, both of them, uh, and, uh, and, and many others who discoursed on, on, on all sorts of things that relate to freedom. And, and so, so we cannot, the, 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 I can't see the difference between, uh, between spirit yeah, and yeah. education. No. Uh, yeah, sorry, so I have uh, just uh, one quick clarification for Professor Anjum. Um, Dr. Abdurrahman does deal with Iqbal um, pretty, I would say, engagingly at the end of Surah Al-Akhlaq and Mafahim al akhlaqiyah and as Professor Halak can probably say, the English Ubra and Abdurrahman is probably about 4 to 5% of actual, Taha's actual work, 4% of which is just Professor Halak's work, so I would definitely um, urge everyone to read his primary works because the English, um, unfortunately, does not really capture it. Um, the second thing um, is that in this discussion between the, the ruh and the tatbih, or the, the spirit and the application of modernity, um, Daha's letter to, to you, Professor Khalaf, that you yourself quoted, was that he said that the, the Arab and the Muslim have become sukar al-hadatha, obviously evoking the ayah. Uh, su sukar al-hadatha, like intoxicated with modernity, obviously evoking the ayah of wa ma bi sukara wa lakinna adabullahi shadeed. Um, and that his, his sort of critique was not that he necessarily disagreed with you, and again, this is probably jadal um, al-shi'ariyun, or an emotional argument that like Muslims are so intoxicated with modernity that he just wanted to sort of bring it gradually and as you said like that itself does not really jive with the rest of his oeuvre or production um, in thinking about those distinctions um, between modernity um, and itself and I would love to see hear you sort of flesh that out response to the emotional aspect of Thaw's argument that were almost a plea to be like Muslims are so uh, su al-hadatha that like we need to sort of um, not bring such a sledgehammer um, at once but perhaps you have a different take on that and the third thing um, is that um, in Taha's conception of ethics, obviously he starts off with, you know, the, the Quranic ayat of, uh, you know, قَالُوا بَلَا شَهِدْنَا or with أَخَذْنَا مِنَ النَّبِيِّنَ مِتَاكُ وَمِنْ يُحْرَمْ وَإِبْرَانِهِمْ إِلَى الْآخِرِ I mean, all of those ayat are the, the foundation of his sort of critique against hadatha that were not, you know, the malik of this world, that were مُؤْتَمِنِينَ um, عَلَى غَيْرِنَا وَعَلَى أَنْفُسِنَا so that in that sense, I feel like we never really got a more, I guess, a furu'i sense of his ethics. And, you know, for me, as someone who is, you know, a, 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 a trained mufti in the fiqh of Abu Hanifa, obviously I see the fiqh of Abu Hanifa as deeply ethical. And I don't see any mention of fiqh um, in Taha's project except at the end of Surah Al-Akhlaq where he uses um, the amal of Ahl Medina to critique the idea of theory and praxis, uh, which was really great. But um, I wonder if he left that to the qadi of his books to be like, can you make that jump? And, uh, of, of that, that, that the fiqh itself can fulfill in ethics and obviously when you read Ibn Abidin um, to Ibn Humam and I, I read those books as deeply, deeply ethical books and the Qawaid of, um, of, of, of the Madahib is deeply, deeply ethical um, but I, I did not see Taha engage in that and maybe that's just because he obviously is not a traditionally trained alim um, in that sense so uh, I would love to hear you think that if you do believe that Taha thinks that fiqh um, can serve that, that, that role of hiwar or muhawir uh, or ufuqan lil muslimina wa li khayrihim and um, yeah, so. Well, it is true, there is, a, there is, there is a, uh, an obvious absence of, of fiqh in his work. Yeah. Um, he's, 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 he's a non-legal philosopher, let me put it this way, by exclusion. Uh, I think the, the, the uh, it didn't alarm me too much because I, I assume, to be honest with you, I assume that his system requires, uh, when all has been said and done, and when people, people would be ready to start, let's say, implementing the, its principles, uh, it would be it, 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 it is some sort of a new fiqh has to be uh, generated. So I agree with you, by the way, on the historical fact that the, not only Hanafi fiqh, the Hanbali fiqh is, I think, even more com more obviously uh, ethical. Uh -huh. And in fact, um, among the four schools, the Hanbalis are, 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 are much more adamant and serious about the moral and ethical component of the legal arguments. This is what, what makes them quite often sometimes seem too, too strict, is because they are morals. Yeah. Uh, the, 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 the most lax of the four, in my opinion, are the Hanbalis. <laughs> 
<laughs> doesn't mean that they are not not ethical. Yeah. I'm saying on the spectrum, or all, all of them, I, it, it would contradict everything I've said yesterday if I were to tell you that they were not ethical. My point is not that. My point yeah. is that on the spectrum of ethics, placing the law on the spectrum of ethics, the 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 the, the, uh, the Hanafis and Hanbalis would be on the more kind of robust side of ethics. Because as I said yesterday, the Sharia is a moral system that has uh, as, its, uh, as its detailed annotation a legal system that serves the moral, the moral purpose. So it's lots of details of, of tech, legal technicalities that eventually succumb to a higher order of ethics. Mm, yeah. So they must be ethical as well, because that they're all operated in many ways in, in the same fashion. But, but, they're into, uh, but, but Atah's system is, is, is at, still at the in legally speaking, is at the level of usul in my opinion. Mm. He hasn't yet gotten into the furu'a yet. Mm. So that's all I can say on that point. Okay, if, uh, would you like to respond to any of the questions? Uh, well, thank you for the correction. I'm, 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 I'm very pleased to know that he engaged with uh, Iqbal. Uh, but I guess uh, I don't want to deal with uh, uh, so much with the question of uh, Taha's own writings as Professor Halak's um, deployment of them. And what, uh, what intrigued me in your answer, Professor Halak, is, your, is the idea that there are really two distinct realms of politics. One is, um, is, is studying the subjectivity of the individual who you know, acts politically, and the other is sort of dealing with the actual political forces. And you want to deal only with the, the foundation. But, First of all, in political theory, this is a well-known distinction between the emphasis of Plato and Aristotle. Plato wanted to do soul craft. Aristotle dealt more with the actual state craft and no political thinking, ethics. I mean, it is, it is Aristotle who was, uh, sort of became the foundation of much of political thinking precisely because he did much more concrete thinking about politics. But, and, and so I, I don't see that separation um, as a, uh, a feasible or a fruitful one, except in a very sort of theoretical, limited sense. To give you an example, how do you know the political subject that you're thinking about would act politically, whether the ethics of this person is going to respond to the actual uh, you know, actual decision-making, actual compromises, actual pressures, actual moral struggles. And at least in the Islamic tradition, whether you look at fiqh or usul or the siyasa tradition, um, the art of making compromises, whether it's through the language of fiqh, of ahmad al and so on and so forth, or maqasid, these were all things that are really necessarily, the subject formation, in other words, is vertically it has to be vertically connected. Otherwise, you could imagine somebody in, in Hitler's entourage who is doing greatest ethical theory because he's just thinking about, oh, the great Nazi blonde man that I'm going to create at the end is going to be the most ethical person. I just need to get rid, need to get rid of these, you know, these dirty people that are not desirable. But that's not thinkable for us, I think. It's not precisely because you cannot sort of vertically separate these two. Uh, these two levels of ethical thinking. But it seems to me that you are saying that it is possible because there's no separation between the two. Because if there's no separation between the two, I'm, I'm arguing that there is another subjectivity, political man, political person, political woman, whatever you want to call it, that can be very different from the way we constructed. Our political system today assumes that there is something evil about the human nature. That, that we are not, the, 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 the very idea of constitutionalism in Western democracy and now everywhere around the world is, is the idea of the separation of powers. Why is there a separation? Why do we separate between the three powers? Because you want one ambition to counter ambition. I'm quoting big philosophers here. When you want to have an ambition, it's all about greed, ambition, and, 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 and every, almost every nasty quality of the human is found assumed to be found in politics, and therefore what you want to do is to make these separate so they can fight each other, and the balance of the fight will be good for, for public good. 
The other kind of politics assume that, that people are actually good. They are the creation. Generally, of course, some of them are nasty and mean, but generally God created man as, and woman, as, as reflecting. They were, they were intended in Islam to be the khalifas of God on earth. It is in the Quran. And if you are a khalifa, you assume to be a khalifa on God, of God on earth. It means that you are replicating and you are supposed to, through what we said yesterday, you are supposed to strive to become a better and better person to such an extent that you, and there, that's where Sufism comes in, the powerful hegemonic Sufism in Islam comes in to say, I am going to work on my subjectivity as much as I can in order to attain the idea of fana. What is the idea of fana? The idea of fana is to aspire closer and closer through the prophetic model in order to become what? To become Khalifa Tullahi al Ard, which is the most sublime animal on, on the face of earth. This is why the being and, and such a chosen animal on the face of earth comes with this gravest of all responsibilities, ethics. This is why the Khalifa should be highly ethical. This is why it is, so all of this assumes a good human nature. Hobbes has no place here. And so, and so there are two kinds of politics and there are two ways. We cannot continue, my good fellow, to think that what we have today is the standard of humanity. Because if we continue to think that we are the standard of humanity, well, good luck to us. We are not going to make it another 50 years. I, 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 I will wager on this myself. But, so if I may, I'm not... I'm trying to understand how a faqih would think. You have the example of the Rashidun, and you have the example of uh, the group Ayatollahs of Iran today. The example that you gave perfectly fits in the role of Grand Ayatollah of Iran, somebody whose formation as a perfect man uh, al you know, allows him to have the supreme power. But Umar says, if I'm wrong, correct me. Abu Bakr says, if I'm wrong, correct me, I'm not the best of you. Even though he's been formed by the Prophet ﷺ himself. And what I'm trying to say that the way a Muslim jurist thinks is, I think, if, if I were to use the language, which I agree with, I, I agree that democracy is based on a cynical view of human nature, but that cynical view often turns out to be true. What do you do with this empirical example? As a faqih, you can't simply say, I'm looking for the perfect man. As a faqih, you will say, I'm looking perhaps for to do both, right? Um, I, I want to uh, be accountable. I want to be accountable to shura. I want to be corrected. Even the prophet opened himself to, to correction and reminder. And how can you say that then, that this one simple subject formation is sufficient. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying you were saying that, but the point is that any political system has to worry about both aspects. And you're absolutely right in that in the liberal moral democracy, particularly, or rather, immoral democracy, particularly in the 20th century, even America was different uh, under sort of Christian influence early on, that more, the moral character of the president mattered until Bill, Bill Clinton, for instance. Uh, so we are going down a path that is really dangerous, but at the same time, I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. I think that you need a mixed regime, if you will. Okay. May I have two minutes? Two minutes and then we'll take a break. I think that we are confusing here the, 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 what I am saying about the, the presumption or the assumption of a particular quality of, of a human being with the, the, what has been called in modern political philosophy uh, the, the problem of dirty hands, that, that, that politics itself is, by its very nature, involves, by necessity, by nature, involves the issue of dirty hands. You have to dirty your hands, ethically and else, as other, other words. So we are dealing, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not delusional about the world. I know that politics and uh, having to make that tough decisions is really tough, and sometimes you have to do things that you don't want to do. There, this is taken for granted in the realm of politics. But, but my, my, my argument is that there are two qualities of human beings who are facing the same set of facts. One assumes the evil nature of, of, of man, and one assumes the good nature of man. And they are both sitting in two different rooms, making a decision on the same set of dirty facts. 
and dirty facts using the dirty hand problem, right? <coughs> would, which one would you choose to, to, to be your, your, your politician? In, in a world where assume, and we are assuming that everybody is playing by the same rule, uh, uh, rules of the game. The bad guy. Which one would you choose? The good one. The bad one? <laughs> Why the bad one? Because dirty facts. He knows how to deal with them better than the other guy. That's Ibn Khaldun. <laughs> no, 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 I think it's a misinterpretation of Ibn Khaldun. Sorry, Ibn Khaldun is severely misunderstood. Uh, no, this is the modern attitude. This is, this is a modern subject we have here. <laughs> but but is, is there not a place for hubs with Asfal Asafili? It, it, is there not a place for hubs? As your leaders and running your not, society? Not as your leaders, organizing. but as a, as a holistic system, mm -hmm. yeah, must we not account for both? Yes, but you don't want them to be making this policy decisions and major decisions about your life. A policy, if a leader of the sort, if they are to be taken, they are exactly going to do what they are doing now to us in, in, in our forms of government. They are going to re-engineer us every moment, control our lives, and whether it is through the internet or through government or bureaucracy or this or that, it's endless and that's why we are in trouble. You want to continue in trouble? Choose that. But it's very easy. I don't think it need, needs an, an, an astrophysicist to figure this out. Is that, is that all of these have consequences. You wanted to deal with the better, because, because he knows how to deal with, with, with the, that situation better than others. Think wider. What does that mean in the world uh, if everybody is doing the same thing? If everybody is throwing a cook, an empty bottle of cook in the, in the garbage, we are in trouble. What we want to do is to create a human who will not that. So, of course, some will continue to throw, but you don't want them to be all throwing the, that, that bottle. And that, that goes for politics. You have to change the game, not the, the players. The players come after the, the game, the rules of the game. But, uh, just forgive me for following up, but. You know, going all the way back to Al Farabi, Al Farabi says that if you have a corrupt community, that a, a virtuous leader will never work. He will yes. either he will either be deposed or killed. Yes. So what's left to us but hijra? Like what's left then? If 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 we acknowledge the the corrupt nature not only of the You're society. Giving it sound dangerous. No, but what <laughs> but what what's left for us? If if we acknowledge the corrupt nature of the society and the, e even the corruption of the philosophical foundations no, that, that society is based upon. What's left for us? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, sure. what, and we come back to, to yesterday's... The, the, the idea is, is not... Listen, you, you cannot do hijra because this will create another We're, major problem. Yeah. Because then you'll have a minority who's militating against the majority and hell will break loose. What you need is, 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 is literally to, 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 to have enough of popular movement that believes in the, in, the, in the need for change towards something of that sort. We should not decide on it now, but at least we know that the change through education is necessary. We begin with our children. We, you begin with your children. And if you are a teacher, you begin with the children in your school. If you are, and, and so forth and so on, until we, it will take a century too, probably. But it's, it's, it, there is, it's very easy. Either we are going to exterminate ourselves in, in, in about uh, 70, 80 years, or we are going to see the light and get out of it in wisely. We are extremely intelligent, but we lack total wisdom. We are zero wise. And there's a huge difference between intelligence and wisdom. We need wisdom. We need, we need a vision of, of larger vision, not an immediate instrumental rational cleverness. This, this is, there's plenty of it. Everybody is nowadays instrumentally clever. We need wise people. 